Hi everyone, my name is Ivan Svetenkov. I'm Lecturer of Marketing Analytics and Marketing Director of Center for Marketing Analytics and Forecasting. And uh, we welcome you in our webinars, series of webinars. We will have six of them. The webinars are called Friday Forecasting Talks. Uh, today we will have Anna Sroganis. Now, uh, this is a slide which we typically start from. Uh, this is the slide that uh, explains who we are, what we do. Uh, we are the Center for Marketing Analytics and for Forecasting. We provide a variety of services, including bespoke short courses, consultancy, summer projects, uh, PhD research, and so on. And we have expertise in a variety of areas, including marketing analytics, supply chain forecasting, inventory management, and so on. And we have a list of uh, our members here. Um, well, the, these are us, this is our group. We all work in Lancaster, although some of us work in different departments. Uh, and uh, talking about the Friday forecasting talks, we have planned six events. If you want to know more about what we have uh, in the pipeline, uh, you are welcome to visit our landing page, which you can reach via our website. Uh, or follow us on LinkedIn, where we pub publicize our future events, our next events, uh, our Twitter and so on. So you can get in touch with us via social media and uh, you know attend our future events. I think that's it from me. And uh, Anna, can you please start sharing your screen? Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining this uh, webinar. Uh, I'm Anna Sroganis, and today I'm going to talk about alternatives to judgmental forecast adjustments rather than whatever title Yvonne had there. And this study is based on the retail case study, actually, that we've done together with uh, Nicholas Krenzes and Robert Files. And um, today I will try to explain uh, what we've seen and what, what interesting alternatives we found as well. Okay, so first of all, when we are, mm -hmm, first of all, I need actually to apologize uh, about my voice. I'm so sorry for that. And sometimes I might mute myself um, to cough. So um, autumn in the UK is cruel. Um, yeah, so uh, hopefully it will be fine anyway. So going back to my topic, uh, basically when we are talking about demand forecasting, we are talking about uh, products that we want to order enough um, and having enough uh, in stock, right? And when we are talking about the demand um, and forecast uh, per se, we are actually thinking about extrapolating past sales using different statistical methods or judgment even and so on. So, um, and this is typically delivered through a decision support system, uh, or we can actually take a part for forecasting uh, per se, so hence it's forecasting support system. And of course it's handled by demand forecasters and planners. So they do um, finalize their decisions in terms of how many products need to be ordered in what period of time and when it will arrive and so on and so on. And of course, this job is not trivial actually due to many factors. And of course, uh, we're all humans. So we are all prone to many cognitive biases. So sometimes we are um, seeing noise um, and patterns in noise, and hence uh, we have different uh, biases, optimism bias as well, uh, takes place uh, in this process as well. So there are many, many issues there. Uh, sorry. Also, yeah. Excuse me, uh, are the slides changing because we can only see the yes. title one? Uh huh. Yes. Okay, good. So I'm here now, actually. So um, I talked about the first bit. Uh, I talked how we are dealing with demand forecasting. And now I'm talking about this expert job um, and what factors might in impact this. So uh, talking about different and clear organizational procedures that uh, might take place in supply chain and uh, makes this process uh, complex and rather 
ambiguous and uh, sometimes imperfect information sharing could take place as well because there are many departments in supply chain uh, domain and hence uh, sometimes they are not talking to each other and they do not know what is happening um, at each stage of this process. Um, and also, last but not least, actually talking about um, decision support systems and how we make forecasts and how we actually um, understand these forecasts as well. So talking about insufficient statistical knowledge from time to time, and uh, these might actually uh, impact our judgment at the end as well when we want to make any adjustments. And suboptimal systems actually um, play an important role there as well, because if you want to correct your forecast, but you can't, uh, then people tend to actually find some uh, ways of correcting it without making sure that the system actually knows what is going on there. So there are many, many, many issues there. And um, if we are talking about forecasting and decision process in forecasting, what we are typically assuming that we have different models of course, we do need to change, uh, check our data first and uh, choose a particular type of data and then select some models that we are going to run on this data or use for this data. And then somehow calculate this model and produce forecast. And of course, um, the last step is finalize this forecast and send it um, to the next step. Uh, either ordering stage or manufacturing stage and so on. And um, actually what we can say is that expert judgment takes place at any of, uh, point of this forecasting process. So at any of this stage um, that you see on the slide, hopefully, uh, you can actually say that there are some decisions that are taken by um, experts um, in this particular case. But the literature typically uh, talks about the last two steps. So when we are talking about judgmental forecasting, we are typically talking about either producing forecast judgmentally, so even without any model, and uh, basically experts just say that, OK, I'm expecting uh, X amount of units uh, sold for this specific period of time. So I do need to ch uh, change them uh, to this particular number. Or the second bit is actually uh, could be adjusting or correcting statistical outcomes. So given that we have a statistical model, basically uh, what we say that we might adjust it either up or down and get um, a number that we like more. Okay, so this is this is um, yeah this is called judgmental adjustments or statistical forecast in this particular case. Okay, so today I will focus on these um, different uh, adjustments that we might uh, might make uh, make. And uh, when I'm talking about judgmental interventions, I will talk about all human inputs that are added either before, during or after statistical model modeling. So uh, we are talking about these different steps and um, different um, decisions that are taken uh, during this process. So and today I will emphasize um, my um, my study are on these two different types. Uh, so judgmental forecast adjustments and judgmental model tuning adjustments. And I will define them just in a bit, but uh, just to give you an idea that we will try to um, try to um, see the difference between those two and how they perform in practice. OK. In order to actually show you uh, what is going on in practice, um, I will use this case study based on UK based retailer with 50,000 SKUs and 400 stores. They use SAP FNR system. Uh, some of you might be aware of this system. And uh, there they keep around two years of data, weekly data for each SKU. Uh, and 
also they they track different events and promotions as well in the system. Skipping side with the forecast horizons, um, actually what uh, we see that when the, this system produces forecasts, then demand planners actually might correct these forecasts based on their uh, knowledge, expertise, experience, either uh, it could be based on weather predictions, revision of promotions, special events, competitive events, and so on. And uh, of course, in the end, we will get final forecast uh, per product, per store, and per day. And those uh, forecasts go to uh, operational activities like ordering, stock control, uh, stuff scheduling, and so on. Talking about our data, uh, what we have is actually six stores with different volume of sales, um, ranging between 22 to 48,000 of SKUs per store. We have uh, some time series information, which is sales in units uh, for two years and one step ahead final forecast. An interesting note here that um, Actually, this company doesn't need one step ahead forecast, but they do produce it. Um, and uh, yeah, and this is what is kept in the system as well, which is quite interesting. And talking about uh, going back to my point about sub suboptimal decision support systems. And uh, of course, we have contextual information as well. So we do have um, some understanding uh, understanding of digital adjustments, what sort of uh, percentage increase or decrease uh, they use there, promotional indicators and special events indicators as well. Once again, talking about suboptimal decision support systems, this is a screenshot for their system. And you can see that we have this red line that is uh, representing sales, historical sales. And this light greenish uh, line is actually your forecasts. And um, you also can see this box underneath that represents uh, these horizontal dash lines that actually um, correspond to different promotions or events. So in this particular case, we have two different types of promotions that are colored differently. And uh, the job of demand forecasting is actually to decide how, um, how useful uh, this information, how can they adjust this forecast and whether this forecast makes sense which is not a really easy job to do, to be honest. So um, <clears throat> what do we see here? That we have two types of expert adjustments. And in, in this case study, we call them judgmental adjustments as, um, as conventionally we, we use this. There are manual adjustments of the system forecast at the final stage. So when you get uh, X as a number, uh, for, for the forecast for the future, you might actually say that, okay, I do like to increase this number uh, by that amount or decrease by that amount and so on. And these will be uh, called judgmental adjustments. But also we have this judgmental model tuning, which is a bit a different idea behind these adjustments. So uh, there, what you would do, you would assume that you have some knowledge of some information or some information for a specific period of time. For example, you know that your model doesn't perform well for Christmas, or you know that there is one day uh, during this Christmas period where um, something is happening, and you would expect that in future this this day, this particular day will actually impact your sales as well. So hence, instead of adding this effect to the uh, final forecast, you actually, what you do, you introduce this dummy or indicator uh, variable at the modeling stage. So you actually say that, okay, at this particular date, I, I have some effect, I will call it Christmas effect. 
on 20th of December, for example. And um, yeah, and uh, you, you allow your model to estimate this effect. So you need to just emphasize this um, effect in the model rather than estimate it yourself, which is a bit easier to do uh, for the demand planners, uh, but at the same time, it's uh, it's possible to do that uh, quite quickly as well. So what do we see here? That we see that quite many SKUs are adjusted uh, locally and globally. Uh, when we uh, when I'm talking about local adjustments, it's for a particular SKU in a particular store. And uh, globally, globally adjust uh, global adjustments. Uh, those that are done for particular SKU in all stores. So different level of aggregation here. And um, talking about judgmental model tuning is actually we see that 92% of all SKUs have at least one event like this. Meaning that uh, those adjustments are easy to implement and actually uh, quite um, quite effective in terms of uh, how they are done in the system as well. Okay, so um, just to emphasize the difference between model adjustments and uh, judgmental adjustments. So what what are the possible just uh, advantages of model tuning actually? Since, as I explained, that you for model tuning, you just need to emphasize the location of intervention rather than the size, and the size is calculated by the model, it introduces higher efficiency in this particular case. It's also easier to implement in the system. It's easily scalable across different SKUs, across different stores, and uh, also it it. Uh, helps avoiding direct human biases. So since you're not estimating the size, uh, basically you're not introducing your own biases in terms of um, optimism bias, for example, or anything like this. And you give this power to a model to estimate this specific effect on this specific date and actually forecast uh, with this information in mind. But the rapid uh, possible drawbacks, of course. So, of course, it's possible to overfeed to the noise. So, once again, we might see patterns in the noise, or we might assume that there is something uh, going on uh, on this particular date, but uh, it is just um, random, uh, random effect. And we are trying to estimate the model um, on this random effect, which is of course, might have some implications in terms of accuracy and forecasts and so on. Um, and also we might include too many variables. So sometimes when our historical data is not long enough and we add too many variables, uh, we might um, introduce some inefficiencies in our models. So we have to be really careful how many variables we add. Uh, to this process. So let's have a look quickly on how forecasters perform in this particular case and if what happens if we compare judgmental model tuning with judgmental adjustments and whether forecasters can identify these additional factors correctly. So what do we do? We split uh, our data into several parts. We have promotions as uh, our um, baseline, so we are not considering promotions as judgmental side because they are planned uh, well ahead in advance and uh, hence we do not have um, power over promotions. But we do have this power um, in variables that we introduce, we call them events, and we also have these local and global adjustments in this data set. So talking about interaction between these different types is actually interesting that events or model tuning uh, is quite scalable as we saw it before. 35% of all the observations are actually uh, adjusted by model tuning 
And uh, you, you can see that there is some interaction between promotion model tuning, global adjustments, and so on. So we do have uh, some double adjustment as well. And um, interesting uh, note about adjustments that are done at the end, that 50% uh, of local adjustments are done during promotional periods. So it might say something about uh, what we observe in terms of uh, local adjustments and how they perform during promotions. And more than a third of global adjustments, so for all, uh, for particular SKU in all stores, interact with, um, intersect with um, events. So model tuning, so uh, there is this double, double side of adjustments there. Just to give you an example of time series uh, promotions and events, Basically, what we can see that uh, we have uh, really a uh, good number of uh, variables introduced into the model, and each of these colors uh, represent different events that we introduce um, for for these time series. So you see that that we have uh, quite quite a number of promotions, which are these uh, light purple uh, lines and also different colors for different events or model tuning. And imagine adding uh, judgmental adjustments on top, of, on top of it. So of course it's, um, it's a really tricky task for demand planners. But let's have a look at the accuracy and how do, does this um, method perform? So, um, not going into details on how we've done it, I want to show you just um, some results on uh, comparison between different types of uh, models that we have here. So the first model that we are comparing is actually company's final forecast model. So, um, and then we are comparing uh, two, um, two different benchmarks. One is exponential smoothing with promotional effects only. So we are um, getting rid of any judgmental side there. And also we have um, ETS, exponential smoothing with promotions and with events. So judgmental um, model tuning there. And what we see that baseline forecast before much better for, for the companies rather than for our benchmarks. And it could be due to the um, system overrides for um, outstock uh, or the heuristics for other uh, problems in the data uh, that we are not implementing in our benchmarks. But at the same time, model tuning, when we add it um, to the system forecast, um, it actually what we observe that the we our benchmarks performing better than uh, companies' final forecast. So this is an interesting finding that actually model tuning doesn't give so much um, value in terms of what it does to the model. However, if we look into local adjustments, so it's for a particular SKU for a particular store, so it emphasizes this uh, specific information that we know about this product. Um, we see that we can't uh, beat it uh, with uh, just two simple benchmarks. So meaning that demand planners actually do have some particular information about this, if, uh, about this uh, SKUs uh, in these particular locations. And talking about global adjustments, <clears throat> what do we find that uh, global adjustments are harmful? So we have to be really careful with those because they typically done inefficiently. So meaning that um, they are actually overshooting uh, sometimes uh, these forecasts and they are done not carefully enough uh, for uh, many SKUs at once, so and many locations as well. 
perform differently. So uh, you have to be really, really careful with these uh, global adjustments, even though they're easier to implement. Um, so there, there should be some balance between these two. And the same applies for model tuning and global adjustments. So when you have any variables introduced at the beginning, but then you also, on top of this uh, model tuning, you adjust this forecast further, it actually uh, har harms your accuracy uh, greatly. So you do need to take into account that double adjustments are, um, are the, performing the worst in this particular case. So quickly recapping this, Basically, what we find that a local adjustments improve forecast accuracy for both promotional and non-promotional modeling. Once again, uh, demand planners have some particular information about these SKUs and hence these local adjustments are useful. Uh, but neither global adjustments, uh, model tuning or double adjustments perform well compare, uh, compared to uh, simple statistical baseline. So we observe that there is a problem with redundant variables added to the system. And also uh, sometimes uh, it's impossible to estimate these effects or they are irrelevant and double adjustments are extremely unreliable, harmful, and should be avoided in any case. So, um, okay, we identified what happened, uh, what is happening there, but still we think that there might be some uh, problem with this um, digital model tuning, and might, it might be that we actually add too many variables, as simple as that. So we want to check whether we can improve a model by adding some uh, indicator variables, but uh, adding them in a um, better manner, manner, let's say it like this. So we try to reduce the number of explanatory variables using algorithms uh, based on their significance. And we create this new baseline forecast, uh, which is based on uh, exponential smoothing uh, model with promotional and uh, promotional effects and subset of effect, events as well. And as you can see here, I'm not going into details, but basically what we see that it does improve uh, model significantly for majority of these um, categories. And even uh, for some categories uh, for local adjustments as well, it does improve um, its value. So meaning that we can actually extract some indicator variables that are useful for this modeling and useful for forecasting in this particular case. So um, how do we deal with this subset? And uh, do we have uh, like a specific events that are working well or not? And uh, not going into the details, but what we find basically that all events that are added into the system uh, manually by demand forecasters, and there are around 40 various events uh, almost all of them are significant for subset of products. So uh, we can say uh, that forecasters add valuable information and the variability of this information actually makes sense, but they're not doing that precisely enough for uh, SKUs, for products. So basically uh, we need to subset products for each of these events to work um, and to get better results. Also, for some products, what we find that even this frequency, so if you remember my example of time series where it was saturated with different variables, uh, this frequency matters and actually improves accuracy. So even if you are just 60 out of 100 uh, something time series, you actually can get better accuracy uh, for some specific products. So it does make sense uh, sometimes to add uh, quite a lot of uh, different variables into your model. 
course, given that uh, you can calculate it and uh, get a reasonable results, of course. Anyway, uh, I'm finalizing this. Uh, so basically what we find that this process of forecasting is quite complex and you might have different hierarchy of judgmental adjustments as well. So either you have local or global adjustments that are done for different um, geographies, or you could actually add some variables into the model and give location of these uh, variables rather than the size, um, especially if the system allows. Also, what we can see that, um, and we can claim that model tuning could be an efficient way of making adjustments because once again, you just add location rather than size. So in this case, a regression or regression based uh, methods could estimate these means much better than any human. So you're avoiding any human, direct human um, biases and cognitive biases as well. And you are just uh, giving some, some additional information to your model rather than um, trying to estimate you and these effects on your own, which is quite a uh, quite good thing to do. But there is a danger, of course. Um, and the first, the first one is adding too many variables. So adding redundant variables, because you can actually adjust or add variable for a, every uh, time period, of course, and uh, that makes your model inefficient. And of course, uh, there is uh, this problem with double expert judgment. So if you add variables first and you add them incorrectly, for example, then you propagating your error from one level to another uh, because later on you will adjust uh, your outcomes based on this model. And of course, uh, it might uh, decrease your accuracy as well. So what this study suggests, basically it says, and uh, confirming previous uh, results for the literature, that negative adjustments are better than positive. Uh, local adjustments uh, are performing better than global. So be careful about your global adjustments and judgmental model to me is useful um, and has uh, good potential, but ineffective. So we do need to uh, think about how we can improve this process, how can we help demand planners to uh, not um, not overestimate uh, some effects or uh, overflow your model with different effects and so on, and how we can extract useful events, maybe using machine learning or something like that. And of course, the double expert judgment harm accuracy, so we need to be careful about those. Um, as for the next steps, um, one of the ideas could be is that we could try to cluster adjustment behavior, uh, including model uh, tuning. So depending on what sort of uh, features you have, or maybe it could be pre-analysis uh, pre as well for some uh, particular SKUs uh, with regards to time, product groups, frequency of these in interventions, inventory performance, and so on. And uh, then the question is whether we can train uh, machine learning algorithms to, uh, to handle this information better and maybe uh, subset these variables uh, essentially before uh, producing any forecasts and uh, yeah, uh, how we can uh, provide feedback based on that as well. So this is all for me, but hopefully. Mm -hmm. I wonder, yeah, did I cancel? Yes. Can you see my screen still? Yeah, we can good. see you, yes. Thank you very much, Anna. Uh, now I need a bit time... over time. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, now I will ask John to show himself and provide some comments. Hello. Hi, Van. Hi, Anna. Thanks very much for your talk. Um, yeah, I've got a few things I'd be interested in hearing your opinion on. So 
One is to try and improve forecasting performance. Obviously, we can do things like train demand planners better and improve algorithms and so on. But another possibility that struck me would be, and I'd be interested in your view on this, to simplify, for example, the promotional offer, because the, the more different types of promotions there are, the harder it is to actually estimate promotional effect. Is that a fair comment? What, what do you think? Actually, yeah, this is um, this is one of the sites that we try to analyze as well um, in this study. So uh, this is an interesting comment. Basically, what we find that some companies have uh, many promotions and different types of promotions. And from a marketing perspective, it does uh, make sense and they like to keep them. But from a statistical point of view, it doesn't make any sense. Basically, some of these promotions do not impact your forecast or your orders at all. Uh, and some does, mm. but mar marginally. So basically, I would say that, yes, uh, one of the recommendations that we had for this company is basically to simplify their promotional activities and uh, simplify the number of promotions that they have. But at the same time, as far as I understand, they they haven't done this. So I guess uh, it doesn't make sense from organizational point of view. OK, OK, thanks. If um, it does make sense. <laughs> well, yes, it's interesting, isn't it? Because I mean, if the if the different if a particular type of promotion is not even engendering extra sales, then I don't see how you can even argue that from a marketing perspective. But anyway, we'll maybe uh, you know, Pass over that. Um, another interest, really interesting finding from your research is this point that you make that global adjustments in particular can be harmful. You started to touch on some of the reasons, but I'd, I'd be interested if you could just amplify a little bit on that, on why you think that was the case compared with local adjustments. So once again, just to clarify, uh, the difference between global and local adjustments is uh, that one so local are done for a specific product in specific store, uh, while global are done for specific uh, product, but uh, across different stores. And since we are dealing with different stores, even in terms of size and um, demand, basically what we observe that these global adjustments that are easier to implement. Of course, it's easier to click mm -hmm. a button and sure. saying that you can increase uh, this by 10% across all the stores. But at the same time, we do see the variability between stores. So mm -hmm. even in our small subset of stores, we see that different, um, different, the same product in different locations perform differently. Okay. So hence, mm -hmm. Mm. Emphasizing this difference yeah. and mm -hmm. um, global adjustments hence uh, yeah. perform completely differently to local adjustments. So mm. local adjustments and also another point about um, the difference between global, global and local. Local are done typically by people in the store. Oh. Mm. While global are done in the yes. main headquarters. Okay. So, so yeah, hence, so, yeah. yeah, hence they in the store, they know that, OK, I don't have this product, so I need to do something about it. While in the headquarters, they might have a number in the system, mm -hmm. but it might mm -hmm. not exist in the store itself. Mm -hmm. So hence they are adjusting something that they, they have no idea mm -hmm. about. Interesting. <clears throat> Interesting, isn't it? Because you're basically saying that um, locality does matter in terms of effects and clearly then if you have local knowledge that will that will help you. No, I thought that was fascinating. Uh, another question which came to my mind is this, when we turn to the um, to those local adjustments, at the moment my understanding is that they are adjusting the forecasts directly, but they could of course instead leave the forecasts alone and simply I'd just be interested to know whether that has been considered at all. So in other, in other words, the forecast is feeding through to an order, isn't it? Yeah. But if you mm -hmm. think about it for a single period, then actually I'm not thinking so much about your model tuning now, but if you go off in your forecast for that period, then that error will propagate for a few more periods at least, right? 
Whereas if you simply make a change to your order, then the forecast can remain unchanged. Now, I'm, I'm just interested in, first of all, have they ever not maybe not gone through that line of thinking, but even just considered order adjustment rather than forecast adjustment and whether you have any any views on that? John, you're making an extremely important point here, but um, and we asked about this as well. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, and an interesting finding that uh, um, we actually came across is basically that orders are handled by another team. Yeah, yeah that's often the case, yeah. yeah. So basically, uh, they want to send these forecasts um, mm -hmm. that are as accurate as possible, uh, sure. while order team will, will handle yeah. their job somehow as well. So, yes, and we're actually missing this bit as well in mm -hmm. this data that we mm -hmm. are not seeing how these forecasts mm -hmm. are actually implemented uh, into see. orders okay. and whether there is any additional yeah. decision making there in terms yeah. of um, increasing or decreasing these forecasts and um, yeah, mm -hmm. that are going into orders as well. Oh, that's interesting. I'm not necessarily saying that's a, a good alternative because obviously essentially you're trying to then judgmentally estimate a quantile which is even harder than judgmentally estimating the mean but anyway um mm -hmm. and the last question for me and then let other people come in um you showed a slide on a sort of system screenshot which seemed quite basic it's got a graph and it's got some lines underneath saying when the promotions could uh, work sorry were held um do you have any thoughts on how that interface could be improved um, yeah, um, so from computer science point of view, uh, this is a really basic interface that they, uh, they are handling there. And of course, this system is not new as well. So we mm, do sure. need to, yeah, to, yeah. to take into this. Uh, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, so uh, SAP FNR system is actually now obsolete as far as I understand. So uh, yeah, SAP created a new system and trying to uh, sell it to their customers. But anyway, uh, we're not talking about uh, promoting SAP here. Um, the thing that um, yeah, this uh, this system is not is some optimal as 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 I said because basically even making these adjustments uh, any any adjustments either model tuning or simple adjustments at the end is not a trivial thing to do in the system itself. So the system doesn't track these adjustments. Um, so one of the issues that we had with this study, that we can't extract system forecast, pure system forecast from the system. So meaning that uh, this system is just handling final forecast, which is already sometimes could implement uh, judgmental side. Right, so hence uh, we don't have this baseline, and hence we mm -hmm. we had to create it. So this is first point that we could work on, and mm -hmm. also uh, in terms of um, visual representation of uh, this um, this system is quite important that people are easily can track effects of different events and promotions and so on. While mm -hmm. now it's just visually. Partially, I would say impossible to do, um, and especially okay. I gave you um, a screenshot with two, just two events, but sometimes those events, as you've seen, mm. there might be m many more. So hence, it's uh, it's not a trivial task to do, especially visually without any any calculations or any um, yeah any feedback or accuracy on feedback and so on. Quite a lot of scope for improvement for their system there. Yeah, thanks very Absolutely. much. I think um, I'll close there because I want to give other people the opportunity to um, either make comments or ask questions. So thanks again. Thank you. Right now it is time for questions from the audience. So if you have a question, please raise your hand. Uh, you, you can use the specific button on Teams and we will uh, let you ask the question or alternatively you can ask one in chat. I see, for example, that in chat, uh, Sebastian has asked, uh, I don't think it's, ah, here it is. I was wondering where the model tuning also cues initially, uh, so that when the model is implemented the first time, if not, could you briefly explain the difference between model tuning and the initial model specification in this setting? Mm, really good question. 
I should have uh, should have mentioned this before. Um, so um, in this particular case, if we're talking about this, this case study, uh, the initial model, uh, when we are just handling data without any promotions or events, it's um, it's supposed to be a simple exponential smoothing model. So without any effects implemented. Uh, but as soon as any promotions um, take place there, then this uh, model switches to regression based model. So where promotions are added as variables into the model. And hence, uh, promotional information is actually part of the model tuning as well, or you can consider that as uh, two, um, um, two different variables, two different types of variables, but um, handling uh, in the same manner. So basically, um, in this particular case, answering your question, model tuning is uh, could be just um specific way of model or uh, model in, in initialization or specification and uh yeah but in this case we call it judgmental model tuning meaning that we add manually these variables so initial model doesn't include these variables into into account i hope i managed to answer this question yes thank you All right do we have any questions from the audience while well, people are thinking, uh, I have sort of question. So you focused your research on point forecasts for obvious reasons, because this is from uh, demand planners. Uh, is there next steps, future work for looking at inventory implications of this? Is it possible to do it all? Um. Yeah, that's uh, that's a good point. Um, as I said to John, basically um, order orders are implemented by different company, uh, but by different department. But basically, uh, yeah, we definitely can estimate um, and run some simulation in terms of how they might handle uh, different uh, orders as well, given different forecasts and uh, different judgment implemented to the, those forecasts. So um, hence, uh, yeah, it's an interesting question, but I would say like uh, essentially we need to understand uh, first how to make these different adjustments work in a better manner uh, and then uh, propagate these two orders uh rather than doing that essentially from the beginning you can just make sense mm -hmm. yes it would be also interesting i think to look whether this changes and impact the variance in some way because then it directly relates to the orders uh, yeah i would say like uh, it would be interesting as well from uh understanding of how much it impacts uh, orders as well. So, for example, what sort of variability you might have for adjustments or for model tuning as well, and for what periods it might impact uh, more than the others. So, yeah, th there is a lot that could be explored in this data as well. Okay, Sushu. we have we have a question from yeah. Sushu, yes. Uh, Sushu, you should be able to unmute yourself now. And okay. Yep. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Okay. Thank you very much. I know very interesting presentation. So I have questions, maybe because I missed some of the details. Uh, so excuse me if uh, my question is not correct. Uh, you have uh, part of your research, you want to test this forecast accuracy, right? You want to test that uh, whether those judgmental, I mean, I mean, those adjustments, uh, whether they can help with the forecast accuracy. So we're wondering whether those decisions will, will reinforce the accuracy. So, for example, if the manager decides that uh, I'm going to overrule the forecast, so I'm going to add one more promotions, so will that automatically increase the sales? Increase the sale? 
Did I hear I mean, that correctly? Yes, so increase the sales because you want to have forecast accuracy is the forecast and the, the actual sales. So the difference, I kind of feel, how how can you measure the real difference? Because now the event has changed. So of course, uh, the demand will also change. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, OK, I think um, I get that. Um, so essentially, in this case, uh, we keep some data. We, we, we work only with the data that we, we have uh, historically. So um, and we have indicators for different changes that they made in the past already. So what we do, we just try to estimate the effect of the changes. So whether they've done the change or they didn't, uh, we compare those different categories uh, between each other. So basically, in this particular case, uh, what we do, we estimate accuracy uh, based on the data that we have. But, however, talking about demand planners in real setting, they don't get any feedback or any um, any approximation of what uh, how good they are performing and whether these events or these adjustments uh, increased accuracy or decreased accuracy. So they don't get this feedback um, at all uh, unless they are actually doing that uh, themselves. But as far as we know, um, they sometimes check uh, like connection between orders and forecasts and how they're performing, but they're not doing that on continuous ba basis. I think we're running out of time. So uh, do we have any more questions? I don't see anyone. Well, I have one last but a bit technical question, if you don't mind. So uh, you've tried ETSX, exponential smoothing with explanatory variables. And did you also try the basic one without explanatory variables? Um, I think it, um, yes, we tried. Uh, it didn't uh, perform well um, in terms of especially for promotion settings and uh, especially given the number of promotions. So it didn't make sense to include a simple exponential smoothing without any explanatory variables. Hence, for our uh, case study benchmark, the main benchmark is basically with promotional effects. I think this is also a nice, interesting result because it sort of tells us that promotions are really needed and events are really needed. They bring value there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks, everyone, for attending. Thank you very much, Anna, for your presentation. Uh, thanks to John mm -hmm. for discussion and uh, Sishu and other attendees for your questions. I would also like to uh, thank Ritika, Aurora, and Kandarika Parit-Larga, who are helping in organizing these events. And uh, I see you all next month, where we will have an exciting discussion between Stefan Colassa and Paul Goodwin. So stay tuned and see you all. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.